the CEO of your life in biz? I'm Emily Alderson, and I'm on a mission to elevate the beauty industry one success story at a time. If knowledge is power and seeing is believing, imagine what could happen if you expanded your mind to the possibilities. What kind of shift could you make happen? This is Stories with Stylists. Hello, hello, and welcome to this episode. I'm really excited to have Julissa Anderson with us. She is the creator and founder of Moonchild Elixir, which um, I love all things moon related. So I'm very excited about that. She's had a really interesting career, and I think we're going to like learn so much through this little journey with her. So thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So I always ask with the first question, where are you from and what led you to cosmetology? So um, I was born in New York uh, when I was about 11. um, Me and my family, we moved to Maryland, like right outside of Baltimore. And then um, what, for my 29th birthday, I moved to Detroit. And um, I guess you could say what led me to hair Ever since I was a kid, um, my babysitter used to do my hair every day, and I used to get so fascinated with how people would react when I would get to school, and they would say, oh my God, like, your hair looks so cute, like, who's always doing your hair? So as I got older, I was like, hmm, I'm still just so fascinated with what I'm able to do with my hair and the different looks that I could achieve, so I guess you could say she inspired me. She was always like the neighborhood hairstylist. Everybody went to her. So I always admired to be like this big hairstylist ever since I was younger. That's so cool. And when did you do cosmetology right after high school then? Actually, I did cosmetology while I was in high school. So I did Votech. By the time I graduated when I was 17, uh, that was when I received my cosmetology license. And then what did life look like after that? Did you go right into a salon or assisting? Yep. So I went straight into a salon. It was like half salon, half barbershop. Uh, Afrolistics is owned by Angela Richardson. Um, So I worked there for quite some time, at least like maybe seven years. And then um, he actually gave me the shop. So I owned it for quite some time. Um, and then on me, like transitioning, i um, pretty much getting ready to move and stuff and still trying to figure out my way in the beauty industry. Um, I ended up working at another barbershop, uh, called a King's barbershop owned by my friend, David Gross. Um, so I worked there for a while and then I just woke up one day and I was like, I want to move. And, um, I was visiting Detroit often. Um, I fell in love with the city. I ended up getting my hair done out here. And I was like, oh my God, like my hair looks so good. (laughs) So the more I talked about it to my friend, um, she was like, you know, Detroit is like hair capital. And I was like, there has to be a spot in this city for me to fit in and just be able to do the work that I want to do. So uh, about a month after... I moved here. I ended up meeting my boss, Jasmine. She owns Studio Lush, the current salon that I'm at. And she was getting ready to open up her salon. We met. Um, you know, she looked at my work and we just fell in love with each other. I was like, oh my God, it's I, somebody that felt my vision and could help me. Um, And I definitely supported her vision with what she wanted to do with the salon that she was opening up. So it was literally like the perfect fit. I love all of my coworkers. um, And it's just a blessing to be able to work with people who support you. And, you know, we just want to see everybody grow. That's so so that's where I'm at now. Well, that's like a big leap of faith, but also such a reward for that big jump right Mm -hmm. yeah no definitely definitely I'm super grateful that I did take that leap of faith because it was scary and I honestly didn't know like 
where I was going to start with trying to find a salon. I felt like I was going to be super picky, but I actually met Jasmine through one of my friends, um, Tierney. So they had went to school with each other in Kentucky. Um, that's where Tierney was from. And she really didn't know that Jasmine was from Detroit. So she ended up moving back. And she was like, well, you know, maybe she can help you. Um, I saw her post that, you know, she does hair in Detroit. She's really good. And if it wasn't for her, then I honestly don't know where I would be. I would probably still be freelancing at MAC, at the mall, <laughs> doing makeup and selling makeup products. So I'm super grateful for where I'm at. I feel like destiny led me here for sure. Absolutely. Talk us through a little bit like owning a salon at such a young age and it just kind of being handed over to you. Is it something that you always wanted or it just seemed like a good opportunity at the time? What did that really look like for you? Um, it was something that I also, uh, that I always wanted, I'm sorry, but it was also like a really good opportunity at the time. I took it as a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. Um it was just like issues with the landlord and it was like, you know what? I'd rather save myself now than, you know, be taken advantage of or held liable for anything. Um, because you also have to consider like, you're not just protecting yourself. You have a whole staff, you have clients. So I didn't want to put anybody at risk um, when it came to stuff like that. And I also knew of another opportunity. So my friend was opening up his barber shop, and, you know, we had always worked with each other. So that was like another perfect fit. So um, just being able to help support people that supported me along the way, I feel like that helped take me as far as where I am. Mm -hmm. You know, just showing the support and people that, you know, are always there for you. And I think, I mean, because you were young, that was like a really huge selfless decision to kind of let go of that chapter. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, and if you didn't go Yeah, down, I, it yeah, hurt. Right. It was like, for a second, I questioned like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. But then I realized, you know, I can always start over wherever I want. Like I have that job where I can literally bounce around. Yeah. So I just took it to my advantage. I took it as a huge learning experience. And I'm super, super grateful for doing it. Um, but I feel like me letting the shop go also opened up doors for bigger opportunities. Oh, really? I think actually kind of give me chills because I think that is really big, um, you know, in our industry where it feels like here is the order of things that we need to do in order to be a successful stylist. But that's why I just love with talking to so many different stylists with different experiences because there's hundreds of opportunities. Exactly. For like you have done what special effects makeup, glamour makeup, mm -hmm. you worked in a mortuary. I want to get into mm -hmm. that a little bit because that's such a fascinating career opportunity. Yeah. How did you start doing that? Um, so getting out of high school and doing hair, of course, I went through the stages of like, ooh, do I want to go to school? What am I going to go to school for? Um, so I was always interested ever since high school you know, the process of funerals, you know, because it's not too often that you hear people say like, oh, I want to work in a funeral home, mm -hmm. like, you know, just being around dead people. So I saw it as something that I could do that would set me aside from everybody else. Um, it was like, this is a piece of cake, like I can handle this. Yeah. Um, so I thought about going to school. I took a couple of classes at the community college and I was like, you know, before I really get into this, you know, let me volunteer at a funeral home. Let me see, you know, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So when I was 19, I started volunteering at March Funeral Home in Baltimore and I um, shadowed a licensed mortician. Her name is Glennis KK. And I would just follow her around, watch everything she did. I would help her out. And then not long after I was doing that, maybe like a couple months to a year, 
um, one of my friend's moms had passed away and she asked me, she was like, you did my mom's hair. Like, I don't trust anybody else with it. So I was like, okay. And then she was like, well, I mean, I know you know how to do makeup. Like, do you mind, you know, fixing her makeup and stuff too? Because she didn't like how the funeral home did it. So I was like, I mean, okay, cool. And then I did it. And I was like, wow, this actually wasn't like that bad. You know, especially after volunteering, I got to, you know, see firsthand the process from the time the body comes in up until they're off to being buried. So then another person, you know, that I knew had passed away and then their family was like, oh, well, you know, you did their hair. I, and then it became like a repetitive thing. And I was like, well, I mean, this isn't so bad. Like maybe I should really start advertising for this. So that's like the kind of complicated part because it's like, how do you advertise for mortuary hair and makeup? So I'm beginning to break the ice more, um, you know, doing stuff like this. But like, I really appreciate you asking me because it isn't a topic that people touch on too often. But like I said earlier, it's a great conversation piece. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, when you're out with people and you just meet for the first time. So um, I'm really starting to open up more about it. Like I just did another funeral uh, in August. Uh, one of my clients had flew me to Maryland um, because her sister had passed away. So I did the hair and makeup for that. So I, I, t I put a lot of pride into it. I really love doing it um, because it the families, you know, final goodbye mm -hmm. you want them to look their best um I always think like I want them to look like they're asleep yeah it is something that's so personal and and what we do anyway is so personal but this kind of like final goodbye and final gift to the person is is really something special for but sure. yeah it's probably I can only imagine it's hard to market it's, would make for a interesting Instagram feed <laughs> You know, like, how do I advertise this? So I'm still like a before and after. It's a little morbid. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So we're, yeah, I'm trying to get past that. But doing stuff like this definitely helps break the ice mm -hmm. for it, just to, you know, put it out there. Yeah. Um, because a lot of hairstylists, you know, maybe they're not aware, like you can actually do that. That could be a nice little side hustle. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, get a contract with the funeral home. They just call you when they need you. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that's so neat. And it's, yeah, it just is such a really special gift. Yeah. Um, and I like it because I can also set myself aside from the morticians that are used to doing the makeup because they have experience doing makeup on people who are alive. So I know how to make those features not look so morbid. You know, mm -hmm. I know how to do um, different effects to, you know, make the skin look like it's glowing rather than they just slap that thick, it's super thick makeup that they right. put on, you know, the bodies, but it's a huge difference. So I like that. Yeah. And that's probably so comforting to the family, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't want them, you don't want them to not look like them and you don't want them to look dead, I guess. Right. You want them to look, you know, as close as possible oh. to themselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, even, you know, while I'm doing it, like I have pictures of them, you know, uh, just to use as reference. Mm -hmm. So yeah, put a lot of pride into it. That's really neat. I think that's special. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, you ha have created your own styling product, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Do you want to talk about Moonchild a little bit? Yes, yes. Um, Moonchild Curly Licks. Oh, yes. So um, I put so much love into this. Oh my God, I stayed up like so many nights trying to figure out like what can I create that anybody can use um so I always figure like one of my favorite products is a leave-in conditioner mm -hmm. I'm like super easy peasy the less stuff that I have to put in my hair the better um normally my hair is like big and curly <laughs> um I straightened my hair so I braided it so it could be like a little wavy yeah. um but 
I can literally just wash my hair, spray this on, and I diffuse it with my Dyson blow dryer, and I have big, you know, super juicy, nice curls. It doesn't make your hair stiff. Um, all the products are all natural. Um, there's protein in it to strengthen your hair, sweet almond oil for moisture, and collagen to help hold in all those beneficial products. So, yeah. It's something that I put my heart into and I cannot wait to expand and to grow with that. Um, I definitely want to create more products, but this is like my pride and joy. <laughs> I'm sure it's like a little baby. What was the process like? Like, how did you even know where to start creating a product? Um, so I had a lot of help from my cousin, um, Jasmine. Uh, she's like my little business guru, marketing expert. Um, and we had always talked about it for years. Like, she's like, I know you could do this. You know, you just have to start, you know, with figuring out what products you want to make, what you want to put in it, you know, your audience, who is this geared towards. And the first thing I could think of was, you know, curly girls, you know, natural hair. Um, I do so much of it at work and I don't want to send people out the door questioning like, okay, what can I use to maintain what she just did? Right. Um, you know, I want them to be able to get that quality that I offer, even if they're at home. Cause I always tease my clients and I tell them like, yeah, you can get this, but I can't go home with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I won't be with you when you wake up tomorrow morning and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do to my hair? Right. So I definitely wanted to save them from that. Um, and there's so many natural hair products. Um, the It's like heavily saturated. So one line can have 15 different products. Sure. So then people, they're sitting there contemplating like, oh my God, what am I going to use? And then they end up buying all 15. Right. <laughs> and then letting so, it all sit under their... Yeah. So thing, right? I definitely wanted something that would help save them some money. Um, it's a leave-in conditioner and a curl refresher. So let's say after you do a wash and go or a twist out, um, the next day, you know, you take your hair tie, your bonnet off, you spray your curls, shake and go, and then that's it. Okay. And your hair is getting all the, you know, good benefits from the product mm -hmm. and it won't dry your hair out. It'll help keep it moisturized and hydrated. And that's pretty much our best friend, natural hair. We need our hair hydrated and moisturized times 10. That's awesome. Very yeah. exciting. Did you play around with, um, like formulating on your own or did you have help in that? For sure. No, I literally make it in my kitchen. Nice. <laughs> I line everything up. It's like a whole assembly line. It it, it gets pretty deep. It gets pretty deep. That's so Sometimes funny. I like to record myself making it because I just get so in the zone. Uh -huh. And then it's like I have, you know, my recipes all lined up. Like um, my god sister was just here uh, when I made some not too long ago. And she was just standing back looking like, wow, like... <laughs> This is crazy watching you make this. <laughs> so I definitely, definitely put a lot of love into it. But of course, as I grow, I definitely want to, you know, put it into a lab, get it a distributor. Um, so by that time, it'll just be to the point where I can't do it all by myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I um, When I got out of cosmetology school, I actually worked for um, the owner of a product line. And it was the same sort of thing. It was a family run business. And he and his wife and his sons would be like in their garage, you know, filling bottles and putting things mm -hmm. together. And then it grew and, you know, into this huge thing. So, I mean, you're really on the starting lines of that, which is super exciting. It'll be fun to watch. Yes. You <laughs> Thank you. I like, cannot wait get it into everybody's hands <laughs> for sure that's the plan so you specialize you'd say mostly in like natural curly styles mm -hmm, for sure but I literally do a little bit of everything mm -hmm. so braids weaves color but right now definitely like the curly cut natural hair yeah 
That's so cool. Did you feel like over your career, um, it kind of evolved, like you maybe just took anything that you can and have you niche down a little bit? Yes, for sure. So um, I definitely went through the stage where, you know, I was young. Of course, like I said, I started doing hair fresh out of high school. Um, it's not too often that people trust you with their hair. So mm -hmm. I went through a period where I did a lot of kids hair, mm -hmm. a lot of braids. Um, I did a lot of dreads. So it definitely evolved over time. I started doing more and more of everything. Um, so now I can definitely say like I specialize in natural hair. Um, but I definitely still do a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. um, which is cool because it gives me, you know, that diversity and it sets me aside from a lot of other hairstylists um, because I am literally a one-stop shop. So mm -hmm. um, like I do a lot of weddings and stuff too. Cool. So it's cool if a bride can hire a hairstylist and then she's like, oh, you do makeup too? I'll hire you to do my makeup. Why hire two people when you can hire one? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Did you, are um are you still at Mac or you just do mostly makeup at the salon? I'm just mainly at the salon now. Um, I'm a freelance artist for Mac, so I have the ability to pretty much like work whenever I want or bounce around. Um, so that's the cool part about that. But I've just mainly been at the salon. That's cool. What do mm -hmm. you see as next for you? You're kind of like settled in your career a little bit. You're feeling good about all the things that you've done. Like what's next? For sure. So I'm actually working on traveling more um, and doing hair, of course, pretty much going to different salons and connecting and networking with different hairstylists um, to pretty much teach them how to master the versatility of natural hair um, you don't have to learn how to do everything, but being able to learn another service that you can add on to what you do, mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be super beneficial, it could be lucrative, it can expand your clientele, and it's just another avenue for you to reach an audience that you're possibly not reaching right now. Yeah, I think it's always good to have everything in your pocket, even if you don't choose to use that at some point but right. it's important to be able to service any client that comes in the door for sure because as hairstylists we have the ability to do so much and after cosmetology it's pretty much up to us to get that training mm. to actually put it into work and to you know be fruitful from it yeah absolutely mm. what do you find um like, what's your inspiration as far as, like, getting education? Are you going to classes all the time? Where do you like to find stuff like that? Stay up on the trends? Well, actually, um, with my job, we do a lot of classes um, together. Uh, we always, you know, have some type of training and stuff going on. Like, we just had a meeting yesterday. Um, we're real heavy into furthering our education, as well as being able to teach other hairstylists. Cool. Um, so I'm super excited about that, the atmosphere that I'm in as far as us growing. It's amazing. It really is. I do love my job and I love my coworkers. I love that. What would you give as advice to anybody who is thinking about going into cosmetology school? So I would definitely say just follow your heart. I know a lot of people, um, I don't want to just single out older people, but a lot of people in general feel that um, being a hairstylist isn't a real job. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like there's a huge population of people that look at our careers as a hobby instead of an actual career. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely want to say don't pay that any mind. If doing hair is what you want to do, it is very much possible. Um, I've seen people work nine to fives and still do hair. So it's very possible. Um, 
and just keep your mind open. The world is endless for a hairstylist. Yes. There's so many opportunities out there and work hard. That's it. Nonstop. Nonstop. Because that's what keeps your passion going. You just love, love what you do. Yeah, the, I would say that's the the passion in me doing hair um, and just being in the beauty industry and being able to make people feel as good as they look. Um, that's like a huge thing for me. I really do love my job and what I'm able to do for people. Do you have, because you're clearly a hard worker and very motivated, <laughs> but do you have any advice around like, keeping your sanity or setting boundaries with clients or coworkers. Yeah, for sure. So me and my coworkers, we're actually all really close. We're salon sisters. We don't even really call ourselves coworkers. Aww. Um but there is always some degree of separation because we work with each other so much. Yeah. So it's like we know to respect each other's boundaries like um, with me just moving to Detroit, what, maybe almost two years ago, I didn't really know too many people out wow. here. So I couldn't always just depend on them like, oh, these are my friends. I'm just going to hang out with them. You know, I'm really, uh, I put myself out there. I started making friends, networking, really getting to know people. Um, so in that sense, I guess you could say like, we definitely respect each other's boundaries. Um, with clients, there's even a bigger degree of separation. Um, I'd have to always be stern because I'm, I could be super nice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to treat you, of course, with the respect that you deserve. And I'm going to give you an exceptional service. But um, we often have to remind clients, like, I'm not your friend. You cannot take advantage of me. You cannot, you know, just feel like you could do whatever you want type of thing. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to protect your space and your energy. Uh, you have to remember that you can't service everybody. You can't please everybody. And when one person won't pay, somebody else will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that is so important to remember. <laughs> for sure. Um, what about even just with yourself? Like you have a lot going on. You wear a lot of titles. What do you do to kind of keep yourself grounded? I meditate a lot, a lot. I got crystals all over my station. I got crystals all over my house. I'm always smudging with white sage and Palo Santo. Like I'm super um, in tune and spiritual. So whatever I have to do to clear my energy, I take a lot of baths. Um, you know, my uh, homegirl Tierney, she, you know, told me and suggested stand outside in the grass barefoot and just... Mm -hmm soak it all in so I definitely definitely stay on top of that um and it was a lesson learned I definitely went through the stage where I didn't know if I wanted to do hair anymore okay and it was like oh like I'm starting to not like this mm -hmm. what am I gonna do and that was when I just decided to pack my things and leave I was like yeah I gotta get out of here <laughs> I feel I was like there's so much more than Maryland and I'm in like a smaller town outside of Baltimore um Glen Burnie so it's like this is cool and all but this isn't for me no more mm -hmm. so yeah I love that yeah I think it's those kind of like small moments of pause you know sometimes when people hear meditation they're like I don't have time for that or I don't know how to do it or I, I've got too much going on like I can't quiet my mind what would you say to them um it's definitely worth making time for it even if I have to sit and meditate for like five minutes mm -hmm. that's five minutes that I deserve because yeah. I feel like after a long day I work hard um so I definitely try to do a lot of little things to um just you know take care of myself even like stuff outside of work I do like a lot of arts and crafts um, I love outdoors activities. I've been working out a lot more, going bike riding, anything to like feed my inner child and just, you know, mm -hmm. make me feel like, okay, 
yes. you're doing it. Yeah, what you, know, you, you want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that inner child stuff is so important because it's that play, that just like mm-hmm. pure joy, pleasure of just play just for fun. It doesn't have to mean anything else. Yeah. Yes. I find that it's definitely satisfying. A lot. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I would say that's very important for any job that you have, even if you aren't a hairstylist. Definitely yeah. make time for yourself even if it is just a couple minutes a day mm-hmm. so um me and my friend Tania we talk every day but now we tell each other like okay so when we wake up in the morning we're gonna meditate or work out and we're gonna say affirmations to each other oh like a buddy system That's perfect. yeah so you know we're holding each other accountable yeah. we're making each other feel good um and of course technology is like super cool because all of my friends uh, from back home I'm able to talk to them yeah. so even that helps you know making time to really you know stay connected with people too mm-hmm. any advice on somebody looking to make a huge change like geographically and kind of starting over what kind of mindset did do they need to have to rebuild um you for sure have to be open-minded um this was like a huge sacrifice um the first I would say seven months that I lived out here I um, was staying at Airbnbs I would rent an Airbnb for a month I would um work at Matt and then I would go to Maryland once a month for like five to seven days I would do everybody's hair I would fit like 50 people in a week And then I would make that money and then I would go come back here mm-hmm. and work at Mac. And I did that for like the first seven months because I felt like, okay, I need to find somewhere where I feel comfortable. And I saw, I'm not from here. I only visited a couple times. I'm like, let me get a feel for the area. So I stayed in seven different areas of Detroit until I finally was like, okay, I'm at the salon. I'm making, you know, the money that I want to make. I completely forgot about Matt by this point. I was like, oh, whatever. (laughs) Right. So I felt super comfortable and I was like, okay. And I found my home and I love it. So it's definitely like now my safe haven. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I'm all settled in and nested. And I'm definitely glad I did it how I did it. Yeah, it was hard, but it was it was worth it. (laughs) Yeah, but I feel part of that was you not settling for just anything, right? Like you exactly, exactly. So that was a huge thing for me. I was like, once I move into somewhere, I just I want to stay there for a while. I don't want to keep bouncing around. Mm -hmm. So you know, I did that little sacrifice, you know, for a couple months, but it was worth it. So anybody that's deciding to move to another state. You know, do your research and technology these days, you could find anywhere to stay just by clicking on your phone. There have been numerous times where I would be leaving the airport like, "Hmm, where am I going to stay this time? And I'll book it while I'm at the airport. Oh, my God. (laughs) So, yeah, it's possible. That's so awesome. (laughs) Well, this has been so cool. I mean, you have such a amazing journey all the different things you can do where can people get in touch with you on social media thank you thank you so um my instagram is hairmistress underscore um what else and you can also um what on twitter same uh handle and what you can also get the moonchild curly elixir off of hairmistressaes.com But other than that, you know, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to DM me. I do respond. Um, I definitely always want to definitely make time for the people who have been supporting me. Um, So I just love connecting with new people. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And then you'll, um, you can do travel for like education and stuff if people want to have you in their salon. Yeah, for sure. So I I am available for pop shop, pop up shops. Um, you know wherever. I, my dream is to go internationally. Right now, I'm trying to go to London. Ooh. Um, so yeah, wherever wherever I'm down, I love traveling. So I'm always open to connect. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much for today. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you liked it, and I know you did, please don't forget to leave a five-star review. I love hearing from other stylists, so take a screenshot of the episode and tag me in it at Mindful Hair by Emily. If you have a story to share and would like to be on a future episode, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you guys next Monday with more Stories with Stylists.